Sarah, welcome back to the podcast. How are you doing? I am, all things considered for 2020, I'm pretty damn good. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've managed to kind of mold my mindset into a good place. <laughs> good. And what's been key for you doing that? Well, it's an attitudinal um, shift. It's about coming in quite close and granular with everything because we kind of have to from a physicality point of view. But also, um, I don't know, accepting where the world is at and doing what our various ancestors have done during tough times and bunkered down and refocused attention on other things, which, what do you know, turn out to be more important things like loved ones and nature and just noticing things, you know, um, being probably more discerning. Yeah, definitely. Discernment and uh, deliberateness is probably two things that I've been working on. So, yeah, I've actually, I, I haven't actually thought about this until you just asked me. It kind of just came out. So, um, but that's certainly what I've been doing to be able to cope. And, and the, the wonderful thing is, is it's actually been the shift I'd wanted to do anyway um and i've been forced into it funneled into it and i wonder how many other people going through this are going through a similar thing where you know it was time to maybe make some adjustments and reprioritize and now this is this is forcing things to happen for people yeah um i i i call covid the great revealer um, and it's sort of uncovered a whole heap of stuff. It's uncovered a whole heap of redundancies apart from anything else, right? Like things that just no longer service. And we've had to kind of look at them. I mean, I don't know if it's the same over there in the Northern Hemisphere. I'm sure it is probably magnified somewhat than what it is down here in Australia. But during the whole kind of shutdowns that we had here, people had these big, shiny black four-wheel drives sitting in their driveways doing nothing so all the things that they'd put money and effort into suddenly didn't really count and we had to reassess a bunch of things um so I think it's been good from that point of view and I think a lot of people have been surprised and a lot of the stuff that um I and various climate activists and and people who are in the values community have been trying to spread for many many years all got illustrated all got sort of dumped on all of us in um all, you know, all at once. And even, even the inequalities that I think became manifest during this period, um, they needed to be outed, you know. I mean, that was a gift in itself, you know, seeing how unfairly paid nurses and frontline workers are compared with bankers and stockbrokers who all of a sudden didn't serve a purpose, um, but also seeing in, in the racial inequalities. I mean, I'm, I'm not that surprised that the Black Lives Matters um, issue surfaced in such a broad way during all of this. You know, it was, there was a lot of, there was a scab taken off, you know, and we're having to deal with the wound. Um, and that's a great thing. And I think a big part of this and something you talk about in the new book is dealing with uncertainty. There is so much uncertainty, even in the middle of this pandemic, we're, we're not through this yet. We're still in the middle and figuring things out. So there's, there's a lot of uncertainty. And that's that's inherent in life in general, but I think this this is zoomed in and focusing people in on that and and making people figure out a way to deal with that in a healthy way. Yeah, I mean, I think what it's done first of all, once again, as a revealer, COVID as the revealer, it's revealed how ill-equipped we are to deal with uncertainty. And I, as you know, Jesse, I talk about this in the book in quite a bit of detail. So the first part of the book, I set it all up so that I sort of try to articulate what the issues are, you know, um, and uh, why we are where we are. So I pull apart neoliberalism and capitalism and our consumption addiction and then the loneliness and the fragmentation. But one of the things I talk about is how um, we have become a society that has cocooned ourselves from a whole bunch of discomfort, right, including uncertainty. So I use the example of how we order a pizza in, you know, on an app, and then we don't even have to sit there and go, I wonder how long my pizza is going to take. Because the app tells us, right, there's no delayed gratification, there's no sitting in suspended unknowingness. So we have cocooned ourselves from all the discomforts except for real life because real life when it hits us is uncertain. It's um, 
there's you know you don't get what you want you you know um there's um a whole lot of unknowingness there's itchiness there's annoyances there's frustrations um disappointment and yet um yeah we've sort of managed to kind of seductively convince ourselves we don't have to deal with any of those things by these apps and call centers and we complain about everything you know the whole Karen phenomenon you know that kind of thing we're, we're aware that this is all happening but of course when a real disaster hit or when real uncertainty strikes us, we've, we've got no muscle, we've got no mental grit, no resilience. And that's what I think, um, to sort of jump ahead somewhat, that's what I identify as, as part of the core anxiety, the global anxiety that we're feeling at the moment it comes from that. We are ill-equipped. And so my book tries to, you know, in the, in the course of, you know, a couple of hundred pages, make up for some lost ground and really rally people together to re-appreciate the beauty of getting resilient to this stuff, facing uncertainty, going to the edge, feeling the discomfort and knowing there's worth in that and not not descending into what I call, you probably remember the word because I use it throughout, acedia, that Greek word that means a listless slothfulness, which our culture I think has slipped into in recent decades where we kind of just give up we go it's all too hard it's all too big it's too much I can't you know hashtag I can't even you know and that is a really dangerous place for humanity to slip into right now I mean right when the world needs us well I think there's two different ways to look at this this building of resilience this uncertainty and one is as we're in the middle of this pandemic people that aren't feeling resilient and are suffering from that uncertainty what can we do in the short term? And then what also can we do in the long term when we get to the other end of this to build those skills for the next time? Because it won't be a pandemic necessarily, but there is going to be a next time. So what can we do to have those skills in place so we're more resilient and, and can handle that uncertainty? Well, I might jump to the second part of your question first. Um, but you might need to remind me of the first part if I if I ramble. Um, so I think that um, there's lots of lessons to be learned, and that's something I also say in the book, is that all the solutions exist somewhere in the world. And, you know, wonderfully we have great communication um, tools where we can actually share what people are doing in different parts of the world. And those solutions exist to the climate crisis, but they also exist to some of these other things. So, for instance, in Finland they have a fake news resilience training scheme in all schools and it's incredibly effective it essentially empowers children to be able to know when they're being fed incorrect information and they're going down some horribly dangerous rabbit hole um, and that's been really good and that's a resilience technique um, in holland they have um, these bizarre kind of rituals called dropping and it's the it's kind of the equivalent of the scout movement. They go and drop kids in the wilderness, like the parents literally drop them off on a Friday night and go make your own way home. And the wilderness in Holland, admittedly, is nothing like Canada or, or Australia. Um, but um, there's, you know, a, a New York Times um, journalist went over and investigated and was horrified. But the Dutch actually have a culture of ensuring that their children are tested in this way initiation ceremonies in different cultures, you know, provided this role, got us toughened up. So I think there are different things that we can do at a structural level and we'll need to do that. Milton Friedman, who was sort of the, the founder of contemporary capitalism or neoliberalism, he has a great phrase that I've heard a few times recently and he said that a crisis can create incredible change but it depends on the ideas that, are, that align around the time. So we need to start thinking about these ideas so that when we do emerge, these ideas are the ideas that our, that our leaders pick up and start to cultivate. Um, so it's exciting that these ideas do exist. Now, I think um, to the first part of the question, which I think will feed into the second part, um, we, first of all, if people are in this crisis, because we are in this world where we have a lot of children in particular who are really suffering because they haven't had a culture of building resilience, you know. Um, I think I'm probably a little older than you, but we are of a, a generation that remember when, you know, you were sent out onto the street and you couldn't come back inside until dinner time and all of that kind of thing. We love to talk about it. Um, but this younger generation has been cocooned massively by the entire system, technology, um, consumerism, you know, 
they don't have to wait for anything. They've grown up with Google. They don't have to wonder about the answer to something, you know. So all of that stuff has, has weakened that resilient muscle. So I think what we need to do in the first instance immediately to deal with the distress that absolutely, as you say, exists is, is to start to have discussions about this, actually to normalise discomfort. Yeah, all right, cool. This is really uncomfortable for you. You're meant to be uncomfortable. Um, and so parents, teachers and so on, we need to start saying, yeah, look, I'm really feeling for you. This is really uncomfortable. However, this is life is uncomfortable and um, I find it really helpful and I found it helpful because I wrote this book during the incredible bushfires we had here um, and then the climate crisis that was just escalating, escalating, and I was just watching more and more animals being, you know, hitting the extinction list and then the ramifications around the world of all of this. And then, of course, COVID and then, um, and then the Black Lives Matters movement escalating. So I, was, I had to kind of regroup myself and think about this very question. And what I found helpful was also reading about other times in history where you know, hard shit happened and, and humans actually rallied together and became bigger, more impressive, more loving um, and, in fact, happier people. And one of the best examples or obvious examples is during World War II. Um, studies were done on the British population and, of course, they got hammered, you know, um, during the war. And what they found was that it was actually during the middle of the London Blitz that British people were the happiest they've ever been. They're also the healthiest. And essentially it was because of the camaraderie. They were all bunkering down together literally in bunkers as bombs were falling. And the sense of community and camaraderie and belonging and rallying in together to overcome a problem um, saw them become as human, happily human as they could be. And countless studies have shown um, that this is the case. So I think that if we can start to normalise distress, discomfort, you know, tricky times and discuss it in the framework of this has happened before and the best thing we can do is face it rather than run from it and hide from it and have this discussion, read the books, uh, I think that would help. I really do. Um, other techniques um, that are uh, that I explore in the book, you might remember the the deer and the tiger example, and um, somatic therapy, which is becoming quite popular these days, and there's some great therapists, particularly in the US and in Canada. Um, so Philip Shepard, I think, is a Canadian um, therapist, and he does some great work in this area. They talk about the idea that we have the flight or fight mechanism, and then we also have the freeze mechanism. And we don't talk about that so much, but once you can no longer outrun a tiger or fight a tiger, um, you will collapse. So a deer will try to outrun a tiger, eventually will realise it can't and will collapse in a heap and pretend to be dead. Heart rate stops, breathing stops. For all intents and purposes, it is dead. And it gives the deer a chance one last chance at life. And so the deer will take its time, um, perhaps go, oh, it's dead. I'll go and get my cubs. We'll come back. We'll have a nice leisurely lunch, you know. And in that time, the deer has a chance to jerk itself back to life and run for its life. Um, and that's what goes on for us in a crisis. We get overwhelmed by so many of the emotions, the despair, the uncertainty, all the things that you talked about, and um, as well as anger. You know, there's a lot of anger circulating as well. And what that can do is see us no longer fight, no longer sort of flee, but what we end up doing is we freeze. And so I've noticed over 2000, the course of 2020, so many people have gone into this overwhelmed, numb, acetic space where they just give up. And I think that that's what a lot of children are feeling. Um, parents are really struggling to get their kids to go to school. There's that um, phenomenon of school refusal that is happening at incredible rates. And, look, it's something that needs to be overcome. And the way we overcome it, the somatic therapies, therapists talk about doing what the deer did. We have to jerk ourselves back into gear again. We need to come back online and almost shake off that anxiety that is built up or that overwhelming emotion builds up in our body. If we go numb, it stays in there and festers and becomes a full-blown anxious disorder. 
I'm simplifying things, obviously. Um, however, if we can shake it off physically, which is what we are evolutionarily programmed to do, then we have a, quite a good chance of dealing with it. So an answer is to go off and do really intense physical exercise. So if somebody in your family or yourself, you're struggling with this overwhelm and this despair, the best thing you can do, and if you're in a place where you can do this, run around the block go into nature and just climb up some trees and just really do something that will shake all of that emotion out. Um, and if you're in a place where you've got to go into isolation, and I had to do this process because we had quite an extended lockdown here in Australia, and fortunately it did manage to get our cases down to zero, um, I would dance in my lounge room just for 20 minutes and dance hard. Hopefully the neighbours weren't too perturbed by it. Um, and literally, as um, Taylor Swift says, shake it off. You know, it's a thing. It's an evolutionary thing we need to do. So I hope that answered the question, one and two. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, very, very thoroughly. And it's interesting. You talked about the camaraderie during World War II and the happiness and the health that they experienced at that time. But it's interesting with the current pandemic and being distanced, at least physically from one another, we don't really have that, that luxury of being in a bunker together and, and having that, that close, that close knit camaraderie. So what, what do we do? Is it, is it all about getting together and connecting online like we're doing here? Or how do people substitute for that, at least in the, in the interim? Oh, look, it's a really good point. Um, and this is something that I think we're only talking about now or only sort of relatively recently, I know at the beginning of all of this, it was not even discussed. So um, in a crisis, we are programmed to seek out other humans. So when we're thirsty, we are programmed to go and seek out water. When we're hungry, we are programmed to seek out food. In a crisis, we are programmed to go and seek out other humans so that we can feel safe and have the best chance of fighting whatever threat is in front of us. Now we've been denied that or so many of us have been denied that during this pandemic. And here in Australia, um, I live on my own and more and more people around the world live on their own. I think it's on average about 40% of uh, households are single person households around the world. And it's as high as 60% in Sweden, which is what informed their policy, which is what which was not to do shutdowns because so many of their, much of their population live on their own. So the, the mental health cost would have far outstripped, you know, the other costs. So, um, and I think this is a debate that people are having around the world, of course, as we're starting to see the mental health ramifications of isolating people um, during a crisis. It's precisely during a crisis that we need to, to be together, um, even if it's in a small community, like a family community. So during the Spanish flu in, was it 1918-ish, um, you know, families, there weren't single household families. People were in large extended families. And, and so it was dealt with in a slightly different way. So what do we do about that? Look, th there were studies that were done during over the last couple of months that did in fact show that even if you can have eye to eye contact, so Zoom, you know, I mean, it, it kind of became the, the savior of, of all of this in many ways, although I think people is pretty much zoomed out these days. Um, but um, that certainly helped. I also spoke to a few people that said that, um, so I break this down, as you know, Jesse, towards the front of the book, where I actually talk about how we're not actually lonely from more connects, more social connections. We are more connected than ever before. That Dunbar number of, you know, I think a certain amount of relationships that we're meant to be able to handle, we've far exceeded that. What's missing in our lives is meaningful connection, both with each other with ourselves and with life. And I break that down and talk about how we're suffering from a moral aloneness where we feel disconnected from the, the moral matrix, the matrix that goes, this is what life's meant to be about and, and let's make sure we live a life that's meaningful rather than a life that's about utility and, and consuming. So um, I think that, yeah, just to make sure that we understand this, that we we crave mostly a meaningful connection. So one of the other things that we can do, and I think that the pandemic did this for some people, um, and, you know, I think we need to hang on to this aspect of it all, is it actually forced people to go and 
sort of seek out meaningful engagement. So I found myself ringing people on the other side of the world and doing either a FaceTime audio or whatever it might be and having some really deep, discerning discussions. So I'm really trying to hang on to that. Here in Australia, we've largely lifted out of the the worst of it. I mean, who knows what's going to come um, in 2021, but we've had zero cases for a number of weeks now. And so we're a little bit of an isolated bubble. I don't know that that's a great thing, but in the interim, it's not so bad. Uh, We've got a large country and what's to do here. But I think that there's an opportunity for us to ensure we, we, we learn the lessons of all of this. So the meaningful connection where we actually ask, you know, and I refer to this in my book, beautiful questions. Beautiful questions are the ones that aren't like, how are you? But go down a layer deeper and they're more courageous and vulnerable. So I think there's an opportunity here to connect better. And if you're feeling a loneliness and an isolation wherever you're listening to this in the world, one thing I would say is perhaps apply yourself to seeking out meaningful relationships in whatever way you can do that. And it can be a phone call. Letter writing is a wonderful, wonderful um, art that we've lost, you know, hand writing a letter. And I talk about this, I don't know if you remember, um, from First We Make the Beast Beautiful, I talk about how handwriting, like walking, goes at the same pace as discerning thought. When we're typing, our hands are going faster than discernment and so much of what we lack in life today is an ability an opportunity the time the space to reflect deeply on ideas we just often feel that we're just kind of tripping our way through the day and all the news and there's overwhelm and we don't get to think things through so handwriting a letter to people is probably not a bad way to spend this period in history I like that I haven't done that in years so that would be Definitely something I should try. Good luck with your hand cramps. Yeah, yeah. I got to figure <laughs> out how to do my cursive writing again. It's been so long. Mm. It's interesting. You talked about the beautiful questions and a thought that popped in my head as you brought that up. Do you think a lot of people are pushing aside and moving past those fluffy, let's talk about the weather, how are you today, and naturally getting to the deeper questions because we are in such a time of, of you know uncertainty and so much turmoil does that kind of push a lot of those those you know more surfacey questions to the side and let us get get more real right away with people in general? I would like to think so. That would be the happy outcome from all of this if there was to be one, and I just think there will be one way or another. Um, however, it's hard for me to say that coming. I speak from Australia, and I'm going to be absolutely upfront here. Australia is in a rarefied position and in some ways I feel we're missing out on the true beauty of this experience and I know you've got Australian listeners so hopefully well they may or may not agree I'm not sure Um, we certainly have had hardship and there's obviously an economic downturn etc etc but it in the main we've had a government who's been very supportive um, and there's been all kinds of provisions in place and we've also come off the back of 30 years of uninterrupted economic growth in this country. In 2000, early in 2020, for the first time, we suffered an economic downturn in three decades. So the opulence in this country, it's we're the only OECD country who has experienced this, and um, it's quite remarkable. So we come from a place of opulence and incredible comfort. Then we've done the pandemic in quite a short period, Now, leaving aside what happened in one of our states in Victoria, they actually did the longest shutdown. It was over 100 days, and it was hard for those people. Um, They weren't allowed to go more than five kilometres from their home, one person at a time, face masks, all of that. But they did get from sort of 800 cases a day down to absolutely zero. It's now been three weeks to the day of zero cases. So the state is completely COVID-free. So, look, it's one particular approach. Um, but yeah, I, I think that in Australia, we've very quickly moved back to the old ways. People are shopping again, buying stuff they don't need. Um, and I, I sort of almost feel that you've got to have a quite a long period of exploring the other way to, for it to actually sink in. Now, I do hear people talking about it as though their whole way of being has shifted. They've got more compassion. They slowed down. They've reprioritized what their family's values are about. 
They're not madly running around taking their kids to weekend sports when why? You know, is, is that what life's meant to be about? You know, hurting your children in and out of a car all weekend, you know, to get ahead of other children, which is just a, a horrible concept. But, yes, I would say from Australia we haven't done that massively. I, I, it's hard to say what's happening in the rest of the world, but I suspect from speaking to my friends in the UK, the US, Canada, I do think that there is a really fundamental melancholic reassessment of, of things. What's really hard, though, I think, is that we are not used to things being unprecedented, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like everything's been pretty much preordained. We get warning of things. We don't get too many kind of sudden changes and um, sort of about faces in history and things like that, right? We're just not used to things being hard and weird and kind of unusual. And yeah, I think I think I think that in itself is a discussion that could be had far more deeply. It's not being had. We're just sort of trying to normalise and grasp onto certainties and go, well, we've got to take it back to this because this is what we're used to. No, 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 the world's changed and the world does change and we're going to have to get agile and there's an opportunity to find this fun and it's an opportunity to shed ourselves of the stuff that actually landed us in this problem in the first place and, you know, we can start with consumerism, buying shit we don't need. It's a huge, huge issue and it doesn't make us happy. We know this and we've had a period where we've had to go without and you know what? It was actually a relief. So why don't we continue with this? Because the planet can't sustain this many people consuming as much as we do. So, yeah, my answer to that is I just don't know yet. But what I would say is to anyone listening is let's get vigilant about ensuring that conversation that exploration doesn't die off because it's such a worthwhile one, you know? It's a worthwhile one for us to go on. For sure. And it's interesting. There are these times in life where we do get to stop and pause and assess, you know, what we're doing and and what life's all about. And often it takes a tragedy, something, you know, like a pandemic. Um, it can be a beautiful thing as well, having a new child, getting married. Um, it seems to take an extreme to kind of like pluck us out of the mundane of day-to-day life to realize that we can make different choices and we can live a different way. So it's unfortunate what you're saying is in Australia from what you've seen so far, people aren't really taking that opportunity. Hopefully, you know, there's more conversations like this and people can start to think differently. A psychedelic experience, that would be another example where people have an opportunity to to pause and think differently about life and, and to, you know, choose a different route. Yeah. I remember, do you remember these hacks that were around probably, I know you've been in this space uh, a long time as well, but remember those life hacks, productivity hacks. It was that, you know, five, 10 years ago, it was the big thing. Um, And I remember speaking to Gretchen Rubin, who's a writer. She wrote the happiness um, project. I think she's been on the show two times. I think it's project. Yeah. You're right. But she has this tip, which was sleep at the other end of the bed. Like it's that notion of, um, you know, just switching something small around and your perspective will shift and, you know, brighten, freshen things up and get you thinking, um, again, more discern- with more discernment, with more, ah, oh, do we really need this? Is this what we want, you know? Um, so, yes, I think, you know, even small um, shifts, small kind of jerks out of our rut, Um, can do that now when we have a big social one like the one we've got at the moment a global one um i think find it a very exciting proposition and and i i I just would love to see more leaders but then also more people on the ground like us starting to really cultivate the idea we can do things differently we don't have to go back to the same old ways and we don't have to shift by five percent it might be required that we shift by 50%, whatever it might be, um, to, to continue life on this planet. And this is what we're talking about. Like let's drill it down to the essence of everything here. Um, we are facing a scenario where, you know, the scientists are saying, I think the, the latest uh, prediction is we have a one in six chance of, of humanity surviving 
to the end of this century. One in six. Depends on whether you're an optimist, you know, a glass half full or a glass half empty type, whether you see that as good news or bad news. But um, it's a reality that we've got to bear in mind. And essentially, if we continue as we are, it's a 100% chance we'll be wiped out. So that's worth keeping in mind. We are going to have to shift and it's going to determine what kind of odds we face. And this is the reality. It's not about saving the planet. It's about saving us. The pandemic, I say in the book, and, and most experts agree with this, it's a reflection of where we've come to um, in terms of the way we are living on this planet. Um, you know, pandemics happen, of course, but they generally come about when we are living in conditions that are too crowded and when biodiversity has been threatened. So that 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 sort of uh, line between the animal world and the human world has been obliterated. So there's a whole range of reasons. And, of course, the way that we live our lives means that the disease spreads so quickly, you know, because we've had so much mobility. We've also become a culture that's not used to galvanising as a community and going, all right, put masks on, stay in the house, do not move until, you know, you have all these anti-maskers, anti-vaxxers, anti-this, anti-that. I get it because we're not used to it. We're not used to being told that sometimes we've got to do stuff for the collective and we're gonna, it's going to have to be hardcore and it's not ideal and maybe there's going to be some casualties. But, we, you know, the collective is what we need to preserve here if we stand back from it all. So, um, yeah, it's, a, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting thing. We've got to bear in mind what's at stake here. It's not the, it's not the planet. It's not the animals. It's us. And it's also a sense of what life is meant to be about, right? We don't want to just exist on a planet that's kind of deteriorating and all those animals from our picture books when we were children have gone. We read the books to our children and go, oh, yeah, no, sorry, giraffes. Giraffes, just, no, they're not round anymore. No, 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 you can't, you know. We don't want that. Like we are, we, we are of this planet, you know, and if the planet is obliterated and destroyed, I, I, I don't think we'll want to to live um, in, in, you know, on Mars, which is one of the solutions that's been put out there. Oh, let's all just move to Mars or the moon or whatever. No, we are of this planet. What do you think, as somebody listening to this, the biggest steps we can take so we can feel empowered and begin to make those changes? What are the biggest steps we can do right away to, to you know, head in a positive direction? Yeah, so I actually really looked into this. I looked into the psychology of um, throwing lots of information at people, um, you know, getting people to be involved in big movements. And it and and I was trying to work out what actually is working because um, prior to the whole COVID, you know, experience, nothing was getting through. And, in fact, we had the bushfires here at the beginning of this year. Um, and then we led straight from that into COVID. And the bushfires you would have seen, I'm sure, it came off the back of the California bushfires, but here they were very, very substantial, wiping out huge amounts of wildlife, um, like 3 billion animals were killed um, and, you know, 80% of uh, the national parks here in, in, where in the state that I live in were, were wiped out. So very, very substantial. Um But off the back of, I was thinking, right, this will be the thing that will get people to wake up to the climate crisis. In fact, it polarised the deniers or sceptics and and those who believe in the science or trust the science. Um, It actually polarised us all further. It actually didn't shift the dial at all. In fact, it went backwards. So those kinds of approaches don't work. So what can work? What can get us feeling that we're going to be moving in the right direction and what will actually make a difference? So first of all, I have a phrase that I steal from Pima Chodron, which is uh, start where you are. I saw this happen where people got overwhelmed that they somehow had to start up a new climate group or a new climate movement or whatever it might be. No, they already exist. Once again, all the solutions already exist. And uh, this wonderful um, American Buddhist oh, Catholic nun, what am I saying? A Catholic nun called Sister Joan, she um, has a phrase and it's follow the good prophets, choose better prophets. So there's prophets out there sharing incredible climate information and activism groups. Go and join them. Unfollow all the people on your Instagram who are doing no good. Join these people who are doing good and start to back them. 
get critical mass behind them. And this is a figure as well that I like to throw out there and people find it really helpful. Um, a Harvard um, professor, Erica Chen Chenoweth, she did this study because she was sceptical about what movements actually shift the dial. And she actually studied every peaceful protest between 1900 and 2004. And what she found was that in all cases where 3.5% of a population turned out, whether they signed a petition, took to the streets, whatever it was, the change happened. 3.5%, it's not a lot. The reason I bring it up is because people then go, ah, oh, well, that's doable, right? That's doable. So, yeah, I'll join that protest. Yeah, I'll sign that petition. Yeah, I'll do what this prophet is asking me to do, write to my local member of parliament and get them to think twice about that new gas, you know, um, gas uh, outlet. Like this is the kind of stuff we need to do and it start where you are. So if you're a busy mum with kids and everything, look out on the local Facebook group. Um, and there's just, I'll give quite a number of examples where people, I mean, Greta Thunberg, um, she didn't go, right, I'm going to start a global movement that gets me on the cover of Time magazine. No, she simply went and sat outside the Swedish parliament with a sign on her own. She started where she was as a 15-year-old student who was in a state of despair. So that is how the world shifts because, and I say this throughout the book as well, care begets care. We are a species that craves demonstrations of fired up care, right? We, we love it when we see, you know, somebody help an old lady cross the road or whatever it is. Our, our hearts melt, we soften. And studies have actually shown we are likely to go off and do something kind for another person when we see it, even from a, from a distance. Um, and there's people that have written about that recently. Um, so, so it's contagious and it gathers momentum at an exponential rate. Three and a half percent, if you can get three and a half percent, then the world can change. And there's so many kind of little snippets of hope that I just try to put throughout the book to go, this is possible, but we've got to choose to do it. And then I try to add this extra layer to sort of make the choice something that we really want to do by saying that in the act of going into this process of signing the petitions or helping a lady across, old lady across the road, whatever it might be, by engaging in care, by engaging in making the world better and saving this one wild and precious life, we actually become the humans, the big, caring, admirable, expansive humans that we've been we've been missing in ourselves. I think part of the reason why we're despairing is we actually don't really like the type of humanity we've become. We've become, we've become selfish and self-centred and insular and that's not what we want to be. So the boon is that by engaging in this, even, and I plant this as a possibility, even if we don't make it, even if we don't save our lives, you know, our one and precious life on this planet, if we don't make the goal, for whatever reason, if we just don't quite get there, in the process, the fight itself will see us become the best type of humanity, the, the, the humanity that we should have evolved to over however many hundreds of, you know, thousands of years we've been on this planet. Um, so, yeah, the fight, the fight is real and the fight is worth it. I agree. And having your hands in this world for so long, being an activist, seeing how things have evolved over the years, You've given a couple different stats there. One was optimistic about how little it takes to, you know, create change to three and a half percent. But then I think it was one in six percent chance that we're going to end up surviving. So you as an activist, again, somebody who has their tentacles in this world and have been there for so long, do you feel optimistic of where things are going to go? Uh, that's a really good question, Jesse. I, I, um, I have a particular, am I optimistic? Not so much. Am I hopeful? Yes, but it's a radical kind of hope. Hope for me needs to be active. So I have an active type of hope. So hope is more than optimism. Optimism sort of suggests that oh, everything's going to be okay. It's about as effective as pessimism, which says it's all stuffed, we might as well give up. Because both suggest taking your hands off the wheel and just accepting what may or may not happen. So I prefer to use the word hope. 
and I, I sort of clarify, qualify it by saying it's a radical kind of hope. It's a hope that is fired up, passionate, etc. And the other thing that I try to do around my type of hope is I, I try to make it as more charming, more fun than the status quo. Now we as humans are not going to shift unless what unless the 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 new version of things is more fun, more charming, um, more engaging than what we've been doing previously. And I suppose that's why I spent three years trying to nut out a path of hope in this book, um, because I really wanted to make it the more charming option. I wanted to make people go, "This is how I want to live. Yes, this is how we're meant to live. This is our true nature." And I've been missing it. This is the the life that I crave. Um, And I I say this in the book. um, It's not terrible when you write a book and you find yourself quoting yourself, but you kind of, it's all you've thought about for for the last couple of years. But when humans love something, like when they love it hard, they will do whatever it takes to save it. We know those stories of those, you know, tiny mothers who can lift a car off their child, you know, off their toddler. We've heard those stories. They're real. We can summon kind of extra human strength and capacity when we need to. And, and you know, the example, again, World War II, America actually switched from a consumer economy to a wartime economy in something like two or three weeks, and nobody thought that was possible. Um, and you know, I think the ta- highest tax rate was 94%. There were rations, the entire country galvanized, even though the war was a long way away. There's examples of that. Then there's sporting examples. You might remember the example I use of how, and I had to use it on my father to explain how this might be able to work, right? We've been to a sporting match or we've watched them and they're the ones that go down in history, the losing side is down by a couple of points and there's 30 seconds on the clock and something kind of strange happens, right, in way more cases than it probably should. And, in fact, the bulk of cases, because these are the stories you remember, the losing side will throw out their normal kind of tactics and go into what I call kamikaze mode, like, yes, and they just roar together. They galvanise, something magical happens, and somehow some lead player, and I'm not going to be able to use sporting terminology here, but they hit the home run, they score the try, kick the goal, whatever it is, in the final 1.2 seconds. And, of course, the losing side goes to, to, to win the game and it's considered a miracle and we go, oh, my God, and we talk about it for years and years and years to come. That's what we're capable of. When we love something and we want something enough, we will save it, we'll fight for it. And that's our challenge is to love this one wild and precious life as much as we can once more. And as you know, one of the big things I talk about for accessing that big love, that bodacious, you know, beautiful, glorious love is is to be in nature because, and there's all kinds of science that shows how that operates by just being in nature we experience awe. We can't experience the same kind of awe in any other circumstance other than when we're in nature. It actually creates certain uh, chemical reactions in our brain that get us to a, an emotional response that we can't get from anything else. Ditto a sense of attunement. The way our eyes work, the fractals, I don't know if you remember, I go forest bathing in LA and they and I sort of learn about this idea that our eyes, our retinas are made up of fractals, these beautiful patterns. So it's nature, tidal pools, flowers, fern fronds, repeated patterns. And when our retinas um, clock it in nature, we have this attunement where we feel like we belong and we're part of something vast. Um, so just being in nature is one of the best ways to access that sort of connection to, to a love of life. And I want to speak about love a little bit more. I think we can kind of break this down a little bit. There's the love for life and the planet. And then we have to, I think, have a deep love for ourselves to really care, to want to change things and make things better. So that involves a different kind of work. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, my thoughts on that are probably a little bit um, 
well, they, they might be a bit discordant because I obviously wrote a book about that sort of inward journey to have a love of yourself and anxious, anxiety riddled and all. You know, that was the first to make the beast beautiful, um, which, you know, you guys were so supportive of a few years back when it came out. Um, but I feel that the pendulum has swung a little too much towards the self-care movement and what I refer to as spiritual materialism. Um, and I feel that we've had a dialogue, which is all about, in, about, you know, going inward and, and loving yourself more, blah, 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 blah. And I think there's absolute worth to that. However, I use the example of the monk coming down from the mountain. You can go and sit up in the mat cave and meditate all your life. And it's great, right? It, and you know, there's, there's evidence to show that that kind of energy can, can spread around the world. However, the real service that a monk needs to perform is bringing that wisdom down into the village. And so that's, I think, where we're at. And I use that phrase in the book um, that our souls are calling us to an appointment with life. And life, the planet, is calling, I think, all of us to come and step outside of our own personal despair, misery, anxiety, whatever it might be, and step up and do the, the, the care work as a collective with, with and for the planet. There's times for all different types of things. And I would say that, yep, we probably did need to do some internal healing for a couple of decades. And that was the dialogue. You know, you and I know it well. We've interviewed similar people and we've had this discussion ourselves. But life is calling out. It's going show up, show up, show up, and uh, we need to step up and do that work collectively and for each other and for the planet. Um, and so, yes, I do believe that we do need to look after ourselves, um, but I'd say and we then need to use that to go outwards. And the spiritual materialism piece um, I think that's a good place to start, that kind of discussion or understanding. So much of the spiritual movement, whether it's yoga or meditation or a spiritual practice, has been about cherry-picking the love and light bits, the unicorns and rainbows bits that feel nice and make us feel kind of swoony and peaceful, right? Now, what's the point of that if we go to a yoga class and we do the whole namaste business and then we walk outside and we sort of step over the homeless person or we kind of scroll through Facebook, nor all the our friends who are doing really great activist work, the prophets that we should be supporting. What's the point, you know? And so, um, you know, this is something that I discussed with that nun, um, Sister Joan, um, and she wrote this incredible book if you're interested in, in you know, um, in sort of this stuff. Um, it's called The Time Is Now and it came out, I think, a couple of years ago. But she um, and I had a big chat about this. She says that we're all sitting in the spiritual jacuzzi. It's all nice and warm and comfortable. Um, and she's like, no, come on, get out, do the work. So, you know, spiritual practice has always been like about sacrifice. It has been about ser being of service it has been about sitting in incredible discomfort at times, pain, discomfort, dark nights of the soul, all of that kind of thing, and not just kind of cocooning ourselves from it and, I don't know, lighting a few candles. It's about pushing through it to the other side so that you can be of service. So that's, <clears throat> I would say that, if anything, the discussion needs to shift away from that internalised self-care. Um, it needs to move beyond it. I think you said it well, where it's like that work needs to be done and that's kind of baseline. And then we got to take that out to the world and, and do something with it. We need to do both the, um, the love and light aspects as well as the sacrifice and being of service stuff. And that piece has been ignored for the last couple of decades by our generation. You know, we've, we've cherry picked the nice bits and it's time to do the hard yards. We probably need to sort of balance things out a little, have this pendulum swing the other direction for a bit. I might be a bit hardline and people might disagree with me there. Um, and I am the first to sympathize, empathize around anxiety and legit pain. And I will be, you know, I think we need to be there for each other in that space, but not stay in that space. Yeah. And Sarah, like you mentioned, we got into a beautiful discussion around your book, Beast, and you talked obviously a lot about your mental health struggles in that book. 
given 2020 and the incredible amount of anxiety in the air, stress and uncertainty, how has your mental health been through this? Oh, thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, it's a really good question, actually. And a few, just only a handful of people have asked me that, actually. Um, and what I've got to say is that, um, look, there's nothing like writing a book to hold you accountable to your own theories. <laughs> so I wrote a series of books about quitting sugar. I will never be able to walk down the street eating a chocolate bar, you know what I mean, or a, drinking a Coke. So um, it's kind of good in a way. You're held accountable and you have to be quite vigilant. Um, I recommend it highly as a way of, of getting the job done. Um, we First We Make the Beast Beautiful, um, I wrote that and I'm very honest about it because I felt so incredibly lonely in my anxiety and the discussion I wanted to have around it. I wanted to be, I wanted to show that my anxiety could be a superpower and, in fact, that dialogue is what enabled me to write this next book. I had to live out those practices. So where am I now? Well, this current book, This One Wild and Precious Life, it got me dead serious about what matters. And maybe it's a little bit to do with the fact that I'm now cruising towards 50 um, and I've realised there's a number of life choices that I have made that are not regular. Um, and I talk about some of that in the book, as, as you probably recall, around motherhood. Um, it was a, a journey that was particularly bumpy um, and painful and, and it sort of paralleled a lot of the grief I was going through in the writing of the book as I watched what was happening to, to, to life around me. Um, but, yeah, I would say that, as you know, I went into a dark place because I didn't have my hopeful path. I was... I was I was very dangerously close to my deadline, my publishing deadline, and I still didn't really believe my own hopeful path. And um, I won't sort of flesh it out too much because it's at the beginning of the book where I actually articulate what made me switch, what got me uh, really truly convinced of my own theory. And, in fact, I didn't have a theory until it, it hit me over the head. So... Um, my anxiety has actually been healed very much by this work. Um, Greta Thunberg, uh, I remember reading about how prior, you know, a lot of people said, oh, somebody with mental illnesses like her because, of course, she was self-harming um, and she um, is on the spectrum apparently. Um, they said, well, she shouldn't be doing this kind of thing. It's ridiculous that her parents allow it. And she made the argument in some interview, before this movement, I couldn't talk, I couldn't leave my house, blah, blah, blah. This movement has enabled me to come out of my shell and it's almost like it was the right time for a girl like her. And for me, I've got to say, my anxiety has dropped to virtually zero through all of this because the anxiety suddenly feels appropriate. You know, the kind of headspace my head goes into, it kind of matches up with where life is at. Like I think I quote a beautiful uh, Guardian writer, George Mombier, who says, if you're not feeling distress and despair right now, then you're not paying attention, you know? And so I suppose, um, yeah, I feel incredible calmness because I'm putting all of my energy into something very, very meaningful. And um, many philosophers have said this, humans can deal with hardship. What we can't deal with is not feeling necessary, you know? And I think Nietzsche said, you know, we can, we can deal with any how if we have a good why, you know, and this has given me my why and therefore all of the fighting against my anxiety, trying to modulate it, steer it, um, live with it, love it, it's now got a context and, yeah, so very long long answer to your simple question um, but I felt it was important to articulate just how, yeah, I think a lot of people with anxiety have are actually thriving in this time, you know. And apart from anything else, we've seen the dark depths. We've been there. We have embraced uncertainty some time back, you know. It's like, hey, this is our time. We're ready to roll, you know. There's a little bit of that going on, and I can feel that in myself for sure. Do you think all the writing you're doing and being so vulnerable and sharing so much has been healing for you as well? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And that's why even if you're not a, a writer, handwriting things out, like I had a wobbly day yesterday and, you know, um, this is sort of what I produced <laughs> and I'll write on these scraps of paper and it doesn't go anywhere necessarily. Sometimes it might, might end up somewhere, but really I just write it to kind of uh, articulate and be mindful and again have my emotions be able to be expressed at the, the right discerning pace. So yes, the writing, the writing definitely gets me connected. And I suppose I've got a very privileged job because I get to apply my writing to other humans and that application engages me in a connection. You know, I've got to constantly think about where other humans are at, humans who might be Trump supporters or might be climate deniers or or whatever. I want to, I want to connect with these people. There's that roomy quote out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there is a field, I'll meet you there. And, you know, I put a lot of my effort with my writing into kind of getting as many people as I can into that field, you know. And do you feel you have to tame your writing at all to make sure you're not offending certain groups such as Trump supporters or I forget the other one you mentioned there. Are you careful climate about deniers. that? Climate yeah. deniers. Are you careful about that when you're writing and the way you articulate it that way you can keep people under the umbrella and keep your positive message, you know, serving them. I do. I do. And it is a practice, right? But it's a practice that I think we should all go through, which is to find that field, to have compassion um, and to see what it is that drives people to, you know, support a leader that fuels polarisation or makes people feel they can't trust climate scientists or whatever it is. Um, I find it difficult. I'm a very opinionated person and I get riled, riled up and I have to, it's a, it's something I have to work on. And yes, the practice of having to write, write in such a way where I don't want to alienate anyone has actually built that muscle. It's a really good practice. Yeah. When I read the title of your book, This One Wild and Precious Life, one thing that comes to me is and this is something I think about a lot on my own. I actually have a little sticker on my computer here that says you are going to die and not in a, in a sick, you know, not in a sick way, but as a reminder every day of how we only have one wild and precious life and to live it to the max. So for you, is that something you think about a lot, death, and, and, and let that be a motivator to you to live life to the fullest? Absolutely. I have a phrase that drives all my friends mad. When a conversation gets a bit kind of ridiculous and indulgent or whatever, I go, or, you know, somebody's trying to justify a decision that they've made. I'm like, oh, well, we've only got 85 years on this planet, right? Like live, live it wild, wildly and boldly and bodaciously. Um, and I say that all the time when people are sort of talking about, I'm like, got 85 years on the planet. Like, does it matter? You know, like let's max this, you know. I use that exact phrase as well. Um, and we've got to keep pulling back. I, I like the idea of having a, a note on your computer screen. Yes, we are going to die. Now we can either find that frightening and cocoon ourselves from it and run for it and have addictions and avoidant techniques and distractions and then dot, 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 we reach our 70s and our hips are too tight to even play lawn bowls dot, 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 then we die. But that's not the existence that I want. We have an, a fundamental choice here, you know. Um, do we want to sit on the conveyor belt and just exist or do we want to thrive and really be of, I can't find any other way to live life to the max except for being of service, like building and making things better. And, and then to see with a beautiful curiosity how it unfolds, right? If I do this, what can it do over here? I mean, I find a lot of other things quite boring. I don't like dinner parties. I don't like catching up for drinks in the afternoon. I, there's so many things I don't really enjoy doing. But what I really enjoy doing is the creative sport of watching the dots join up. And, and you know, you ultimately want it to be a thing of growth. That's what humans are. We are yearners. We, we reach onwards and upwards. You know, we are not, we're not, we're not, um, we're not beings that kind of disintegrate into a quagmire, you know. Um, so yeah, I, 
my mortal look, mort our mortality has motivated philosophers and scientists and thinkers throughout the years, you know, the the ages. And so I think it's a great motivator. I don't think there's a greater one. And I don't really know of another way other than having like some kind of sticker or something in your physical presence that reminds you of it on a daily basis. Because as we all know, life gets busy and and we get caught in these these habit loops and going through the day, you know, so many of the things we all do day in, day out are, are the same as the day before. So how do we pull ourselves out of that and get into the present moment and make the most of our interactions with family and friends thinking about that? And again, 85 years, that's like a a good estimate of what we have these days. So it's it goes by so quickly. Oh, and it's about 20 years more than it used to be only 100 years ago. Like your life expectancy was 65. Like, you know, so... Look, some of the techniques in my book speak to that. Like I talk about going to your edge, living life at the edge. And we have a life that kind of protects us once again, cocoons us from the edge, shelters us from, I mean, we have nets on trampolines and we have signs if there's a gap in the footpath. Like, like we, and, and we, because of the opulence and the economic growth around the world, um, we have become the least um, innovative cult uh, generation ever so innovation has just gone down like this over the last 30 years um, as sort of technological kind of cocooning has gone like this so the two are correlated and the best things in life happen when we go to some kind of uncomfortable edge you know that's where life really happens and I I talk about the idea of how sometimes to buck that you've got to get yourself into a bit of trouble and I'm not saying this is for everyone, but I know I've always needed this. I've always needed to, to use physical danger, slight physical danger to wake myself up. It's like what you were saying before, the COVID crisis has been the jolt that has got us reassessing things. And at a micro level, I do that. Like I took up ocean swimming. Now, I am the worst swimmer in the world. I never had swimming lessons, which is unusual here in Australia. I mean, sorry, I had them when I was really little, but I never got to be a good swimmer and um I was just in a funk so I was like right what can I do that's going to scare me you know um and I think there's a phrase I think it might have been might have been Eleanor Roosevelt said do something every day that scares you I think it was Eleanor Roosevelt and so I um took up ocean swimming I literally I used to go to sort of an ocean pool and do laps slowly I was like no nah, gonna jump off the rocks and swim across the headlands and where I live there's a shark um, detector, um, a fair way out. So I just make sure I was in from the shark detector, but I was out beyond the surfers. And, and so I sort of took that up and every now and then when I need to sort of kind of jerk myself up a bit, I go off and do that or I go and hike and, and I, and I look, if children are listening at home, um, please do not do as I say. Um, but I hitchhike and I've hitchhiked around the world right up until this age. Um, and you know, it's a form of, going to my edge I go camping um and I'll go and find some rocky outcrop in the middle of nowhere and set up my tent and it I have fear for sure um but it's a beautiful kind of fear and what happens and I talk about this in the book is we go into a space where we fend we have to create out of nothing we've got to find a way to get our way through I'll do a hike where I know there's no chance that I'm going to be able to get back in a day you know, and I know I'm going to have to kind of come up with something creative, you know, and generally involves hitchhiking. Um, so, yeah, I think I think there's opportunities for us to do that. We can do it on a small level. We can walk down the street and we see somebody crying on a park bench, go over to them, a stranger, take the risk and say, hey, are you okay? Sit down with them. Um, you know, I'll... I, the other day I saw a homeless man on the train and I know sometimes they just sit on the trains just to sort of be part of something. And a lot of people got up and moved from him because I think he was, well, he had a rather strong smell uh, going on. And um, I stayed seated. He'd sat down sort of close to me and we ended up chatting and he had this incredible life story and that kind of thing. And it was uncomfortable. I've got a very strong sense of smell, so it was deeply uncomfortable. But, gosh, it was it was galvanizing, you know, it was beautiful. It was like I had to get off the train and I just said, you know, thank you. That was an awesome conversation. We 
we sometimes have to choose to get into a bit of trouble to go to our edge to start to see things with a fresh perspective. It might even mean walking a different way to, you know, the bus stop each day or whatever it might be. Mix it up, you know, sleep at the other end of the bed, as Gretchen Rubin said. I like that word, the edge. And I think it's different for everybody. Somebody who's new to this, maybe it's just saying hi to a stranger as they're walking by them or just simple, basic things, like you said, and then you can work your way up over time. Yeah. And then you'll just be a really annoying person like me who will go and just talk to anyone uh, and uh, strike up sort of a vulnerable conversation that they don't know that they really want to get into, but they go there anyway. Um, so yeah, you can sort of dial it up as you get used to it. Did writing this new book bring you to your edge? Oh my God, yes. How so? Um, well, you probably, I mean, this is the, the penultimate chapter in the book is about becoming an adult. And what I actually point out, and this is what I worked out in real time as I went through the journey, is that um, all of these practices, this this kind of mission, right, to go to your edge, to live more fully, to um, do everything that you can, et cetera, et cetera, to wake up to the disconnection and it's, you know, whatever, there's a whole range of things, um, is essentially about becoming an adult, right? A proper grown up. We used to have rituals that would initiation ceremonies that would see us moving to adulthood through various practices that got us to own our stuff. Now, I feel that we've been in a suspended state of adolescence the last couple of decades where we kind of take a bit, of, well, we, we understand consequences. This is what teenagers do. They understand the con- consequences, but they'd still rather blame someone else. I mean, that sums up our culture. Oh, I don't think we should change anything about our carbon emissions until China does. I mean, when our children say things like that, why do I have to do it if Johnny doesn't have to do it? Like we, we tell our children, no, you still have to do it. This is what you need to do and this is life and life can be hard, you know. Um, so I actually think that my as I went through this, I actually had to do that myself and go stop blaming, stop being angry. Like I understand the consequences of the way that we're living and that's why it's doing this, this and this. All right, take responsibility, even if you've had nothing to do with it, take responsibility because you're a fellow human. So the process did see me evolve into a gutsier, gnarlier, sometimes sadder adult. But that's where we need to go as a culture and that's where I needed to go as well. And so, yeah, that's that was the process for me. I've shifted dramatically. I've become far, um, I guess, well, I'd say far wiser, but essentially what it's done is it's just seen me drop to another sort of floor. Like, I've fallen and gone, oh, my God, there's even more work to be done, you know, but it's made me feel okay about that because that, that it's, it's become what I know my life is meant to be about. It's, it's kind of my raison d'etre and it, and it provides a thread for me to follow, one that's kind of more interesting than the conveyor belt of consumerism and ticking off boxes and careers and whatever. Sarah, chatting with you over the years, reading your books, you're somebody that thinks different in a big way. And I'm just curious, where does that come from? Is it, can you trace that back to your childhood or where does that come from? You know, you're, you're, you're unique. It's beautiful, but where, where does that stem from? Um, oh, that's made me a little bit emotional that, um, because it's, that's a realization I've had to come to in the last couple of years. You know, I have not, I have, I've, I've lived on the, the you know, sort of slightly off on my own path, but I've tried to fit in. I spent my life trying to fit in. I mean, I was the editor of Cosmopolitan. Is there anything more mainstream than that? And then I was, I worked for Rupert Murdoch for many years. Like, I mean, I've done a lot of very mainstream kind of, um, yeah, I've, just, I've done a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, and so I spent my life trying to fit in and it's only in recent years that I've allowed myself to it, embrace, I guess, my weirdness. It's only, I, I wasn't aware of it until now. I just felt incredibly uh, disjointed and unhappy. Um, I think that, did it come from my childhood to a certain extent? Um, my family wasn't necessarily intellectual or you know I come from a big family um but I was always yearning outwards so within my family I was a black sheep um much accepted by my brothers in particular like my brothers and my sister they 
let me be who I was. Um, but I would say there's a little bit, I don't know, I suppose I've got to look back and go some, I, I mean, I was diagnosed with bipolar at 21, but I can look back and see that those characteristics, those traits were in place when I was seven or eight. I, I sort of know I was that person back then because, you know, you hear the family stories and I remember certain things and I remember expressions on adults' faces when I used to say things. So I know that I was probably like that when I was quite young. It doesn't, it wasn't nurtured or fostered in my family. I think my, my parents didn't really know what to do with it. Um, and they, you know, they did the best they could, absolutely did the best they could. But, um, so I don't know where, I, I don't have an answer for that. All I can say is that, um, I feel like I've arrived, you know, um, I wish I'd arrived earlier, but then, you know, um, and it would have been nice not to have gone through so much grief to get here. But, um, I suppose it's a little bit like Greta. She's found the right epoch to be engaged. And, um, in some ways the cause, whatever impact I can make in this cause, then, you know, that will be fulfilling and, and the fulfilment has a, a enabled me to arrive. And I, I have actually found it very, very helpful to read the works of other women throughout history, women in particular, because they've generally had to overcome a lot more stereotypes to lift into this space of care or radical care. Um, but one person who's of, uh, of our era, I suppose, is Jane Fonda. And she's become an incredible, I mean, she's always been an activist, but her climate work has been really powerful. And she, I heard an interview with her and she said that, look, when you're a woman, you reach sort of your later years and your estrogen drops off. And basically what it means is that all that attention you put into caring about everybody else and trying to make sure everything's fine and everybody's got enough food and water and whatever, that starts to drop off, drop off. And you can steer that attention to other things. And because you've actually lived a life where you're having to juggle so many things, you've got actually even more attention that you can put to it. And I think that um, that happens for a lot of women as they sort of hit their later years and their hormones shift and they suddenly have this renewed energy to become who they've always wanted to be. Um, and so I think that's played a role, certainly. I can feel it. And... Um, you may have to beat this, but, you know, I have less fucks to give about the wrong things and a whole lot more to give about the right things. And I can feel that it's almost like a, a hormonal thing, to be honest. Yeah. What would you say to somebody out there right now who is giving too many fucks? Like, where do they begin to let that go and to add a, you know, you talked about you wish you got to this point at an earlier age. How does somebody who's younger right now listening to this get there if they, you know, they realize that this is what I want to do. I just want to be me and I'm, I'm maybe only 25 years old and I have my whole life ahead of me. What do I do? Well, two things, two things. I'd first of all say that I'd remind people of that start where you are. You don't, I think if you're 25, quite often I remember when I was 25, I was chomping at the bit and how am I going to be that thing that I think I'm going to be? I would say start where you are. And if you, you know, it might be something humble like being a teacher. Like it doesn't matter where you start. Start where you are and there is ro ample room to be of impact, to do something meaningful from that place. And you might be unemployed. You might be this or that. That is your place to make the difference. So um, dial down the stress and the over-expectation, you know, and I think this is something that will turn people into a overwhelmed, numb, um, inactive position because they actually think they've got to be out here. They've got to be Greta in a day. So that would be the first thing I would say. And then um, I would say, secondly, um, the times are perfect for you. The times are calling out for more wildness, you know, and it's appropriate. And you'll be less ostracised today for it than you would have been th even three years ago. And so I think the world is looking for expressions of bodaciousness and freshness um, and you know I think Trump is a bit of an example of how um, one can come out with whatever wild platform right and if you are sturdy in it then people will flock to you because we are after sturdiness 
there's been a lot of wobbliness. Nobody really knows. And, and the stuff that used to sustain us, like consumerism, is looking very, very wobbly and ineffectual and kind of unnourishing right now. And so we're looking for something that looks better and it's got to be sturdy. So what I would say is um, now is a time to allow yourself to experiment with going to your edge, um, maybe uh, firing up in a different sort of direction. But it doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to arrive there straight away. Just start where you are and then keep going and going and going. So it's a twofold thing. Dial down the expectation, but also, which will then enable you to do it anyway, despite the fear. Um, and yes, the times are the times are right. And like, so Dr. James Hollis, who's an incredible Jungian psychiatrist or therapist, psychotherapist, he came up with that phrase that our souls are calling us to an appointment with life. And I asked him when I interviewed him for this book, well, that's at a personal level, at a psychological level. What about collectively? And he said, our souls are actually, you know, our, our collective souls are calling us to this appointment with life. It's, it's asking us to lift. So to, so listen to those signs. And some of the signs might be dreams. It might be kind of coincidences. It might be disasters like we were talking about before, a life disaster, a slap down. They're often little kind of nudges from our soul going, wrong way, go back, or come on, lift harder. Um, so, yeah, if you can listen to those signs as well, I think it's important. And if you need another nudge, just remember what we talked about earlier, only having 85 years on the planet Get out there, do what you need to do and figure out your why and, and live behind that. You're going to die. And we are, we are beings or a species that need boundaries. That boundedness is our motivation, right? That's our framework. Now fill it, you know, go for it. Yeah. Love that. What a beautiful place to end. And Sarah, it's been such a pleasure, like I said, talking to you over the years and watching your journey with your writing. You started out talking about sugar, which is you know, not the deepest of subjects. And over time, you've gotten deeper and deeper, more and more vulnerable. And the work you're doing is just so important. And, and your journey is just so beautiful. And you're just having such a wonderful impact. And you're a beautiful person inside out. And I thank you for all that you do. Oh, thank you for being a massive supporter. And I just want to say, and I hope you don't cut this out. Um, Jesse sent me a microphone all the way from Canada so that I could um, do this interview. Unfortunately, we couldn't get the technology to work, but it was a gift. And I thought, what a lot, like you just did it straight away. Your email just went, right, nope, I'm sending it to you. Um, and I think that's a beautiful thing. I was very touched by that. So thank you. Stra strange gesture from the other side of the world, but um, I, just, I was just touched and I accepted it because I was just like, oh, go with that beautifulness. Yeah. Well, we didn't get to use it on round four. I'm sure there's going to be a round five. I can't wait to see what you're going to write next. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wait a number of years because I'm now through all your books to date and it's going to take you a long time to write something like this again. But I look forward to it. Thank you so much, Sarah. Other than people getting a copy of this one wild and precious life, how can they connect with you after the show? Uh, look, I, I'm, I'm actually going back to blogging. Um, I think blogging is the new Zoom. So sarahwilson.com, I'm going to be writing some stuff there, experimenting with some new thoughts. I usually experiment in blogs before I write my next book. So we'll see where that heads. And then Instagram is, if you write Sarah Wilson, you'll come across it. But I do a fair bit on Instagram as well in the hiking realm. And I've got a new website that launches, well, it'll be up by the time this goes to air. Um, it's sarahwilsonhikes.com. And it will include all the hikes from my book. And then I'll expand it. And uh, I suppose we can, we can have bucket list dreams for now and, and plan them for the future. All right, I'm going to link it all up in the show notes. Sarah, thanks again. Really appreciate you. My pleasure. Have a great evening. Take care.